Our Father, once again, we give you thanks for the day you've given, for the blessings it's held, and for those that it has yet to hold for us, for your word that instructs us and guides us, your spirit that is our teacher and one that encourages us in our daily walk. <clears throat> we thank you, Father, for each one who's part of our study tonight. We do pray for wisdom, and we might understand the application of that which we discussed this evening. Father, help me not to clutter it up, but help with the content to be clear, and for us then to be able to identify with it and make a decision concerning it as to whether we're going to do what your word says or we're going to continue to do our own thing. We thank you for the grace that is patient with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, for several months now, we have been examining this behavior issue that we have. We have dealt with the issue of having an old sin nature that is a natural tendency or dispense, uh, disposition. That's the word. I use, try to use words too big for my vocabulary a disposition to sin, a natural tendency on our part because of our humanity and the nature that we inherited as a result of being born in a race that has fallen as a result of Adam's sin. So we spent considerable time looking at that and examining that, and we've kind of shifted gears now in the last several weeks and we're trying to move to a different aspect of that where we might consistently apply the word of God to our lives in order that we might not do what our old nature has a tendency to do. But on the other hand, that we might do that which is pleasing to God. And by the way, that which is pleasing to him is his design for that which is best for us. Sometimes we get the idea that we're supposed to live a certain life in order that we might please God. Uh, the reason he has written these things instructing us in life is that we might have a fullness of life. Uh, we might experience all that, jo that God has designed for us in the way of joy, in the way of peace, in the way of contentment. But it's a growing process. And so we're looking at that. Some time back, we looked at the need to go in and tear out from our conscious minds and what we call the right frontal lobe where our, our conscience is located and our norms and standards are established, to go in there and tear out the old stinking thinking, the old way of thinking that we did before we were believers, to replace that human viewpoint with divine viewpoint. And when we accept Jesus Christ as personal Savior, the scripture identifies that we have experienced a new birth, a spiritual birth. Uh, Jesus uh, had a little conversation in the third chapter of the Gospel of John with Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, about that, telling Nicodemus that a person had to be born again if he was going to see the kingdom of God. Of course, if you recall, he didn't, uh, Nicodemus didn't quite grasp what that meant to be born again. And Jesus explained to him that in our physical birth, the birth of the flesh, that we are born with body and a soul. But in order to understand and relate to God's things, uh, spiritual things, we have to experience a different kind of birth. We have to be born of the spirit of God so that the unbeliever is body and soul, but the believer is body, soul, and spirit. The soul having the ability to relate to human experience, but the spirit, the human spirit, having the ability to identify with Holy Spirit who indwells us and instructs us, and the human spirit then has the capacity to understand the things of God. So it all begins at the new birth, and the scripture is quite clear in teaching about the new birth. It taught that through the Old Testament ritual, uh, from the time of Adam until the time of Christ. Uh, the ritual under the Mosaic law, under the Levitical system, was 
to instruct them in the need to be born again and how that new birth process uh, was accomplished. Abraham believed God and it was, it was accounted to him for righteousness. He experienced a spiritual birth as a result of that. So as we have been examining the scripture, we have seen the need for the new birth, the need to be born again in order that we might have a capacity to understand the things of God. And we've also looked at the, the difference between the indwelling of the Holy Spirit and the filling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit occurs at the moment we accept Christ as Savior. The Holy Spirit comes in to live in us. Our bodies become the tabernacle of the living God. And the Holy Spirit is there to direct us, to encourage us, to teach us, uh, even to rebuke us and convict us. Uh, um, a variety of things that uh, the presence of God within us uh, in the Holy Spirit uh, accomplishes. But we've also seen that we can take the control of our life away from the Holy Spirit. We, we have free will. And with our free will, we can quench the Holy Spirit, grieve the Holy Spirit in our uh, walk, and walk independent of God. When we do so, of course, divine discipline is brought on us to awaken us to our need because it's not profitable for us to walk in those ways. When we confess our sin, and we don't go to some priest or in some uh, commune uh, structure to confess our sin, we confess them immediately to God, directly to God. We as believers are identified as a priesthood, so we have direct access to God to confess our sin. Uh, when we confess our sin, our fellowship is restored. The Holy Spirit has control of our life. We call that the filling of the Holy Spirit. So the indwelling is permanent, no matter what our sin status might be at the present time. But the filling is dependent upon our confession of sin. And that word confession, homo legeo in the Greek, means to name it, to name, identify specifically what you did in agreement with God that it is sin to identify it that. At that point, the Holy Spirit then controls our life. We saw that word filling is from the Greek word uh, pleruste, and it means to saturate to the point of control. When we allow the Holy Spirit to have control of our life, then we walk in a spiritual walk. As babes in Christ, then we are to grow up into Christ. And we've looked at the, the teaching on John the Apostle, uh, where John talks about, especially in the first uh, epistle of John, uh, he identifies four different levels of growth in our Christian walk. Newborn babes in Christ, adolescents, young adults, and then mature adults. We are at any one of those stages at this particular time in our spiritual walk. And by the way, our, our maturing and our spiritual growth is not related to time, not related to chronology, but rather it's related to our appetite for the word, our yieldness to the spirit in feeding upon the word. Some of the most mature believers I have known were just had only been Christians a year or two, but they had a hunger for the word of God and a desire to serve God and coupled together, they grew very quickly. Where on the other hand, I have known believers that had been 40 years in the faith or more, and they were still immature in their Christian walk because they did not take advantage of that which God had provided for them. So we looked at John talking about growing from newborn babies into adolescents and into young adults and then into mature adults. And then we looked briefly at Paul's identification as it related to spiritual growth. And he identified that we were babes in Christ and we needed to grow up into Christ. 
he identified Christ as the head of the church, and we who make up the church as the body of Christ, and that we needed to mature, to grow up into Christ, to put on a Christ-like attitude, to become Christ-like in our actions. And Paul indicated he did that by the intake of God's word, the mixing of that word with faith, putting our dependency upon it, and as we did that, we began then to develop that maturing process. Just as we ran out of time last week, we were looking at the way Peter addresses the issue. And Peter approaches spiritual growth by identifying a series of circles, really spheres, that each one is developed within the other, and they become more restrictive down to the center core. <clears throat> That's based upon his writing in Second Peter uh, chapter 1, uh, and we looked at the first four verses in that chapter last time. We saw in... Uh, in that study, well, let me just read to you the expanded translation uh, that we developed, that I developed. And, and let me remind you what an expanded translation is. We use the King James translation or the New International Version or uh, the Revised Standard, uh, the American sta New American Standard. A variety of different translations are available to us. <clears throat> when we refer to a translation, we are acknowledging that the Old Testament was written in Hebrew and the New Testament was written in Greek. And so because the majority of Christians uh, are not proficient in Hebrew and Greek, then it's necessary for us to have an English translation uh, of the Old Testament and of the New Testament. Some are good, some are mediocre, some are bad, and some are really terrible. <laughs> I have uh, in my library a um, cotton patch translation of the, the well, not all the New Testament, but some of the, the letters of the Apostle Paul. And um, the, the writer, the translator that did that, didn't pay a lot of attention to the original language. As a matter of fact, his translation is, is based... Uh, on the English, King James English text, rather than the original Greek and Hebrew text. And uh, he took a little liberty, and instead of talking about the epistle to the Romans, um, well, he did talk, he did identify that one to the Romans, but then he, he relates it not to, to Rome, but to Birmingham, Alabama, and other epistles to Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, to Washington, D.C., and uh, uh, he was writing to cotton pickers, uh, those that were working in the cotton fields back in the uh, 30s and the 40s, the migrant workers, and so he tried to put it in their language and um, into places that they might recognize instead of Corinth and Ephesus and Laodicea and, and uh Rome and Thessalonica, he, he related them uh, to towns in the South. So uh, his objective was to try to get them to be able to understand the word, but he really distorted it uh, in the process. So you put up with me for a while now, and you'll continue to be uh, dogged by me and referring to the original Hebrew or the original Greek. What I've attempted to do in, in some of these studies is to write out an expanded translation of the verbs. And because one Greek word, frequently in English, it takes a sentence or a paragraph to explain what's in that one word. When we do an expanded translation, what we actually attempt to do is use all of the grammar the rules of grammar in the Greek and the Hebrew <clears throat> to bring into English the fullness of the meaning. So if the word is a, is a verb, we identify what kind of verb it is. Uh, 
uh, whether we, it's the mood of it, whether it's subjunctive or whether it's um, imperative or whether it's indicative. And, and when I start in that, I see some of you reach up and turn and hearing it all. Uh, but uh, uh, just bear with me and we will seek to give it understanding. I, I know some of us struggled with the Greek, with the grammar when we were in school. We don't want to struggle with the grammar when we go to Bible study or church. But uh, the expanded translation is to pull out the full meaning of what the grammar says. And so sometimes it gets a little wordy. Verse 1 of chapter 1 of 2 Peter, in my expanded translation, says Simon Peter bond slave, and one of those with the battle plan and the authority to execute it. Now, where did I get one of those with the battle plan and the authority to execute it? In your English Bible, it's the word apostle. The word apostle. That's a Navy rank. It's an officer in the Greek Navy was called the apostolos, the apostle. And he was the one that had the battle plan and had the authority to execute. So when the writers of the New Testament identify an apostle, they use that term to identify the one that has the battle plan and has the authority to execute it. The apostles of the church were given God's battle plan and the authority to execute it. Now, we don't have apostles today because we have the battle plan already printed and available to us in the word of God. He has given us the entire battle plan, at least all that we need to know to wage war in the campaigns that he, he places us in. So Simon Peter calls himself an apostle. So we translate that. Simon Peter, well, first he called himself a bond slave and then an apostle, and so we've said, and one of those who has the battle plan and the authority to execute it. Now, who is it written to? To those who have, as a matter of principle, once and for all obtained by their action, equal precious dependency with us in the sphere of the conformity to the specifications of the plan of God even our Savior, Jesus Christ. Bon is, uh, Peter is identifying himself as a volunteer slave to Christ, as an apostle that by Christ has been given the battle plan and the authority to execute it, and he is writing to those who have made it a principle to once and for all, by their own acceptance, place their dependency upon their the conformity to God's plan for their life. They have accepted Christ as Savior. And uh, now he goes in the next verse and says, grace to you. And may an attitude of tranquility resulting in stability be multiplied in the sphere of a fully applied perceptive knowledge of God, even the Lord of us. So he says grace to you, and he desires that those of us who read this epistle may have an attitude of tranquility. Well, I can use that, can't you? That results, however, in stability. And he says, may that be multiplied in our, in the sphere of fully applying the perceptive knowledge that we have of God, even of the Lord of us. So at the very beginning of this epistle, we're given the assurance that Peter has a servant's heart, but that he has God's battle plan and he has the authority to execute it. So his address is to those who have acquired the same precious dependency that he had, those who had uh, 
place their faith or their dependency upon Jesus Christ for salvation. And then in verse 3, we, we see he goes a step further, and he says, seeing that God's divine inherent power has, as a matter of principle, been given completely with the result that we continue to possess everything pertaining to life and to a piety that is characterized by a Godward attitude that performs that which is pleasing to God through the full experiential knowledge of one having called us into his honor, his esteem, and the qualities which procure the highest opinion. That's the calling of God upon our life, and we're, we're going to work through that then and see more fully just exactly where he goes with us in that. For he makes this statement then that uh, God has given us everything that pertains to life. He's made available to us every answer that we need, everything that we need, in order that we might live a full life, that we might live a meaningful life, and that we might put on the characteristics of Christ. In other words, that we might become Christ-like. That, that word Christian uh, originally meant little Christ. It came to be identified with Christ likeness. And what we desire in our life is the peace and the joy that was manifest in the life of Christ. But frequently we want to go, go another route, find another source to get that. So we get in, in what we call sublimation, trying to find substitutes uh, for the applying of the word of God to our life that we might experience the fullness of what he has designed for us. Now, we're going to pick up tonight at verse 5. We left off last week on this verse, and uh, we're going to pick up at that point, verse 5 of Second Peter chapter 1. He's going in this process to lay out for us how we, who are humans, who have an old sin nature, who have habits uh, of sin and a tendency to sin, going to lay out for us how we can become Christ-like in our living and experience the fullness of what God has designed for us. And what he's going to do is draw a circle, or actually it's three-dimensional, it's a sphere. And then he's going to tell us what that sphere contains. And within that sphere, we are to develop another sphere. And within that sphere, a smaller sphere. And in that sphere, another sphere. sphere. And he's going to walk us through that to a more constricting relationship with God that is going to culminate in love, in self-sacrificial love. For if there was anything that would manifest uh, Christ's likeness, it would be the love of Christ operating in us and flowing through us in our daily walk. So look with me then as we pick up at, at verse 5 of chapter 1 of Second Peter. He said, and beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. The word, the, the verse begins with, and beside this, literally it should have been translated, but, beside this. Well, this is a conjunction of contrast, but beside this. And what he actually says is, but also beside this. They left out the word also when they translated. It's uh, 
as I say, it's not translated in the uh, King James, but he's saying in addition to the promises, we spent some time last week knowing that we were to claim the promises of God. We were to utilize the promises of God. So in addition to our resting upon the promises of God, he has set forth for us then that in addition to that, he's going to lay out a process, a mechanical uh, process that we are to go through. We are to have faith in the word of God, faith in the promises of God. Now that word faith is from the Greek word pistuo. It means to put your weight on it, to put your dependency upon it. Uh, you are, for the most part, this evening as we are in this class, you have exercised some faith. There, I just saw an example of faith being exercised when you sat down in that chair. You had faith in the chair that it would hold you up. You probably didn't give any thought to it um, because we've sat in chairs before. And unless the thing looks awful flimsy, we generally don't check it out. We generally just sat down in the chair. Faith is sitting in the chair. It's putting our weight or our dependency upon whatever object it is that we have faith in. If it's faith in God, then it's putting our weight or our dependency upon him. See, that, that's why I say when we talk about, well, how are things going? And we say, well, I'm hanging in there. Well, that's not faith. What we need to do is turn loose. Let God take care of it. Put our dependency upon him. And uh, we don't do that quite with the freedom that we do sitting down in a chair uh, that we may have sat in before uh, or that we have seen constructed in that manner before uh, that it is going to hold us. We do it without thinking. Well, that's the way we've got to get in our daily walk as Christians. We have to become so accustomed to believing and putting our weight and dependency upon the promises of God and upon the principles that are found in his word, that we do it as automatic as we sit in a chair. So that word faith, pistuo, means to place your weight or dependency upon something. So he has admonished us here in the fourth verse that we are to place our dependency upon the precious, that is, the valuable promises that God has given us. Now, he says, within that sphere of faith, of our dependency upon what God has promised and what God has proposed in his word, we are to develop something else. Within that, within that sphere of faith, we are to give all diligence, and in that sphere of faith, we are to develop virtue, virtue. Now, I want to emphasize just briefly that phrase, give all diligence, because what he is actually saying is that within this sphere of faith, within the environment, if you will, of faith, we are to develop this statement now of virtue. We are to develop virtue, but we are to do it with a fullness. He says, giving all diligence. Now listen to this word giving in the Greek. It says, in addition, make it a principle to repeatedly exhibit all diligence. Well, what is all diligence? Well, that's translated from the Greek word that means haste and complete dedication. Haste and complete dedication. The, it involves the concept of zeal and commitment to this 
process. So he says, with, uh, with haste and zeal and complete dedication, then you are to fully supply, fully develop in this sphere of faith, you are to develop virtue. Now, we work hard on trying to develop faith. Uh, it's a day-to-day -day struggle in our lives as we tend to doubt, to question, to, to have fear uh, and worry. Uh, worry is a, is a sin because worry is the opposite of faith. It's either saying that God is unable to take care of my situation or that God isn't concerned enough to take care of my situation. And so we work at the process of having faith, but faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So the more time we spend in faith, the greater our, or excuse me, the more time we spend in the word, the greater our faith will be so that we will get to the point that we sit down in it in the same way that we sit down in a chair without questioning it or turning it upside down and examining its structure and seeing about the bolts and the wells that are there, whether it's going to hold us. When, as we continue in the word of God, then we began to become more reflexive in our faith and, uh, and live uh, by the word of God and develop that sphere of faith. But now within that sphere of faith, we are instructed to develop fully. We're to fully develop faith, but within that sphere of faith, we're to fully develop virtue. Well, virtue is translated from the Greek word artane, but in the Greek text, it has the word ta'in in front of it, the article. He's talking about a specific virtue. He uses this word artane with the article, and it says that moral behavior that procures the highest opinion of others. Now follow this, as we place faith in the word of God and upon God, we put faith in God, within that faith, we are to develop a moral behavior that will procure for us the highest opinion of others. In other words, they are to see a change in our morality as we develop faith in the word of God and faith upon the provision of God, we are to fully develop that kind of moral behavior that will procure for us the highest opinion of others. Now, this, this word uh, that is related to a behavior here, uh, artain, uh, is a feminine word. Remember, we've talked in the past about a Greek word. Uh, if it is feminine, it's identifying a response or a responder. If it is masculine, it's talking about the initiation of an action. This word is feminine. The proper moral behavior for you and for me as believers in our walk with God is a response to his word. Not something that we initiate, but something that we respond to. So we are commanded to fully supply within the sphere of our dependency upon the promises of God, that specific moral behavior that will cause others to have a high opinion of us. Now notice the, the moral behavior is developed in the sphere of faith. The sphere of faith is that 
environment in which we place our dependency upon God and upon his word. You see, if we are placing faith in the word of God, then we are attempting to live the word of God, and we are responding to what the scripture says about our moral behavior. We have a problem in the area of moral behavior because we tend uh, to excuse ourselves as being sinners saved by grace, and uh, we have uh, that old nature, and we've already seen it's our natural tendency to sin. And so we tend to excuse our moral behavior because of that origin uh, from with which we were born. But now remember, we have been born again. And as born again children of God, we are new babes in Christ, and we are to grow up into Christ. That means we are to change our moral behavior. And that change of our moral behavior is related directly, related directly to what we believe where we have faith relative to what God said. When God lays out a plan by which we are to govern our moral behavior, if we have faith in it, well, let me rephrase that, to the degree that we have faith in it, we will follow it. It will become the guide to our life. So when we say that we believe the Word of God and we're having faith in the Word of God, but we walk contrary to the Word of God, we've not believed it. Not to the point that we put our dependency upon it. We're still seduced by the old nature that we can have greater joy and greater happiness hanging on to the old way of life. So it's within this environment, if you will, sphere of faith in the word of God and upon Christ himself that we are to develop a new morality, high moral standard that will cause others around us to recognize there's a change in our life, that our behavior is different from theirs. So our first guideline as we develop faith, within that sphere of faith, we are to relate it to moral behavior, to develop the proper moral behavior that will procure for us the highest opinion of others. Now, within that sphere of virtue, of the proper moral behavior, we are to develop knowledge. Did they get that backwards? Doesn't it seem a little strange to you that uh, we are to develop faith? And then within that faith, as we place our dependency upon what God has said, we change our moral behavior. And then it's within that moral behavior that we develop knowledge. That seems to me, from my human perspective, that the knowledge would come first, that we would develop knowledge, and as we develop knowledge, then we would develop the proper moral behavior. But you see, we have to understand this is God's word. And he says, my ways are not your ways, nor are your thoughts my thoughts, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so much higher are my ways than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, our reasoning would say we develop a good uh, knowledge of the Word of God, and by that knowledge, then we develop virtue. No, you cannot know the things of God unless there is the development of virtue in your life. Your ability, my ability, our ability to know the things of God, to understand the things of God, is related directly to our proper moral behavior. Now, how can that be? Well, let me take you back to our earlier study. Now, I've reminded you that when we sin, we take the control away from the Holy Spirit 
and we give the control of our life back to our old nature, back to the old man. That unconfessed sin in our life brings about carnality. That is, we become fleshly in our thinking and in our attitude as well as in our dealing. So unless we have rightened things with God before we approach his word, we can't really understand his word. We have to have the right moral behavior that will bring that about. Well, how can we manage that on a 24-7 basis? Well, remember 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Sin breaks our fellowship with God. Sin short circuits our ability to take in knowledge, to take in the things of God. And so within the sphere of faith, we have to develop that virtue. Now, that doesn't mean that we, we become completely sinless and virtuous before we take in knowledge. Now, that's not going to happen, not in this lifetime. We're not going to attain that perfection. But it means as we approach our uh, desire to take in knowledge, we have to be in that right moral standing to develop that concept of writing our relationship with God and assuring our fellowship with him through the confession of sin. Now, we've already said that we are believer priests, so we don't have to go to some other priest and acknowledge our sin. We go through our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we simply acknowledge our sin. When we accept Christ as personal Savior, we are declared holy and without blame before him. That's virtuous. We are virtuous. We have that, that moral behavior as far as our position is, but we find it doesn't last too long. We find that we, we stumble and sometimes blatantly uh, rebel against God's instruction and are victimized by sin. So through 1 John 1, 9, we are able to acknowledge that. We are able to confess that. Now, remember the word homologeo means to identify specifically what you did. That's part of the process of developing that proper moral behavior as well. When we start calling sin, sin as God calls it, instead of excusing uh, our behavior, then we're on the road to developing the proper moral behavior that will procure for us the highest opinion. So, Though we sin, when we confess that, we are declared immediately virtuous and holy before God. That status must be reached before we can truly take in knowledge. So whenever we study the Word of God, whenever we meet together like this, we should take a few moments to utilize the process that God has given that is, in the privacy of our own lives, to confess any known sin so that we can take in knowledge. You can't develop knowledge apart from that virtuous standing with God. Now, I try to be careful here because sometimes some folks say, well, I can't understand what, what you're teaching. And uh, there are two prerequisites to understanding the Word of God. One is you have to be born again so that you have a human spirit to understand human uh, or spiritual experience, spiritual phenomena. The other is we must be in fellowship with God. There must not be any unconfessed sin in our life for us to have that capacity to take it in. Now, in addition to that, sometimes we teachers in our enthusiasm over what we see in uh, the language and, and in our desire to communicate everything that we learn, sometimes we get a little cloudy and fuzzy, and so we have to take responsibility uh, for that. 
But if we are allowing God's spirit to control us and we are staying controlled by the spirit that is filled with the spirit through the confession of sin in our own private lives, then we are, according to Peter, in a position to develop within that sphere of our moral behavior to develop knowledge. Now, this word knowledge is translated uh, uh, nosen, uh, from the Greek word nosen. And by the way, it has the word the in front of it too. So he's, he said there is one moral behavior that we are to have. And he says there is one knowledge that we are to have. The moral behavior is feminine in gender. You will have the right moral behavior if you respond to the word of God properly. You respond to, in faith, to the word of God. You'll, you will have the right moral behavior. The same thing is true then in taking in knowledge. It is feminine in its gender, and it is singular. When we are controlled by the Spirit of God, the response is to take in knowledge. Now, there are a variety of different Greek words that are translated in our English Bible by uh, our English word knowledge. This word notion identifies the process of taking in knowledge, not just knowledge itself but the process of taking in knowledge. Now, that's what I'm attempting to guide you through in our study here on Tuesday evenings, the process of taking in knowledge. So it begins with believing God, that is putting our faith and our dependency upon God and upon what he has said in his word to the point that dependency expresses itself in the response of our maintaining fellowship with him, of our ceasing to sin, putting sin away from us. Now, we're not going to cease completely from it. That's our objective, but we're probably not going to do that, though the potential is there. And so we're going to have to use 1 John 1, 9. We're going to have to confess our sin so that we can Respond then to taking in knowledge. Now, I want to point out that this word, uh, no sin, is not only feminine, identifying a response, but it's in the accusative case. That is, the accusative case establishes offense, limits, and boundaries around a particular thing. So, the use of the Accusative case here identifies that this process of taking in knowledge establishes the boundaries in which our behavior is to operate. So we are going to be limited in our response by how well we take in this information and apply it to our life. Now, a sincere Christian that's ignorant of doctrine will never experience the joy and the purpose of his life and will not be effective in the, the representation responsibility that he has for the Lord. Good intentions is not going to cut that. We have to go through this process. The that follow the mechanics. See, the scripture didn't just command us to be ye there for perfect, even as your father in heaven is perfect, but it gives us the guidelines to do that. And by the way, that word perfect in the Greek is teleon. It's, it's not sinless. It means mature. It means complete. And we are to grow up in to that. So this is what we find in verse 5 as I take the Greek text and translate it. He says, but also for this very reason, 
that is that we have escaped the authority and the influence of the world system. In addition to that, make it a principle to repeatedly exhibit all haste and complete dedication in fully supplying in the sphere of your faith that moral behavior that procures the highest opinion of others. And then in that sphere of that moral behavior that procures the highest opinion of others, fully supply the process of seeking knowledge. And this word knowledge is knowledge that is acquired through inquiry and investigation. You see, we just can't, can't say, God, give me knowledge, and he overwhelms us with knowledge. The knowledge that is spoken of here is knowledge that is acquired through our study of the word, through our inquiry, through our seeking, our investigation to get that knowledge. So let me point out some principles here that we have seen. The promises of God provide a potential for you having a partnership in the divine nature, for you to put on the characteristics of the divine nature, for you to exhibit in your daily behavior the characteristics of God. Secondly, we have escaped the authority of the influence of this world. God has made it possible for us to walk daily with him out of every temptation he has made the way of escape so that no temptation has taken us but such as is common with God and he has made the way of escape out of every temptation. So we have escaped the authority of the influence of this world. Not the influence but the authority of that influence over our life. We now can make a choice. In order to escape the influence, we have to do what we're studying here tonight in this passage in Peter. In the sphere of our dependency upon the promises, we are to fully supply the behavior that will procure the highest opinion of those around us. And then in the sphere of that behavior, we are to fully supply the process of seeking knowledge through study. Fourthly, we are to do these things with a diligence. That is, making it a principle to repeatedly exhibit every haste and complete dedication to the task. So, focus on the promise of First Thessalonians 5.18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And give thanks in all things, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, he didn't say give thanks for all things, but in the midst of everything, we are to give thanks. Now, focus on that promise instead of the adversity or the circumstances that you're confronting. I've been communicating with one of my granddaughters, my oldest granddaughter. She's a mother of three and has suddenly developed some lumps on her neck. And so she had a CAT scan uh, last Thursday. And we've been waiting for the results of that. It's the unknown that usually gets us, the uncertain that causes us to slip over into anxiety and frustration and worry. <clears throat> what we are attempting to do in the midst of this is to give thanks for God's will is being worked in this process. Now, frequently I've had people say, uh, well, in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, it says, give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God. What is the will of God? The circumstance that I'm having? 
or is it the will of God that I give thanks? The answer to that question is both. Our circumstance relates to the will of God. Now, be careful, because that doesn't mean God determined that we were going to, to have those circumstances. And when we talk about the will of God, there are three aspects of God's will. God has a directive will, which he reveals to us through his word and through circumstances. He has a permissive will in which he allows us not to follow his directive will, but he gives us a little latitude that we might do our own thing. And then he has an overruling will. In the overruling will, he says, nope, <laughs> weed my whips. You're not going there. He overrules our free will and keeps us from doing what we intend to do that is harmful uh, to us uh, and not to our advantage. He overrules our will. Now, I don't know about you, but I frequently said, God, take my permissive will away from me. That's where I get in trouble. Make your directive will clear and I'll stand by it. And when I don't want to stand by it, overrule me with your, with your perfect will, with your overruling will. But God doesn't do that with us. He gives us free will. He provides for us direction, his directive will. But he gives us the permission frequently to walk contrary to that. But there are times when he says, no, no, I'm not going to allow that. That's not good for you. It's not good for what you represent. And so he overrules it. It's that permissive will that gets us in trouble, isn't it? So when we say whatever our circumstances are, that is the will of God. Now, it may be his directive will, it may be his permissive will, or it may be his overruling will. Whatever circumstance you are experiencing right now, that is the will of God. That doesn't have to stay that way, because if it's permissive will, you can change that. And if it's his, his overruling will, you can seek the directive will and get into it and overcome that. But in everything, we are to give thanks because that, the circumstances are the will of God. And it is the will of God that we give thanks in everything. Knowing that God can use that, remember Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that God causes all things to work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. So matter, no matter what our blundering uh, attitude and rebellion might have gotten us into, God is going to cause that to work together for our good. Now, there may be some pain, loss, or suffering in the process. So we want to avoid that if we can. But uh, he is eventually going to work that together for our good. So the circumstances may not be to our liking. They may even be threatening. But we are to give thanks based upon who and what God is and what God has said, rather than our fear of what is going to come of the circumstances. So we're going to study that uh, a little more uh, and, and get a little greater. We need to, to get the greater knowledge about these things. Uh, and we'll only get knowledge in proportion to our our moral behavior and our moral behavior dependent then upon our faith. Faith, within faith, develop virtue. Within virtue, develop that pursuit or seeking of knowledge. Now, we're going to see there are four more things that are added here by Peter in this text. Temperance, patience, godliness, and brotherly kindness. And if we do these things, we will find then that God's grace provision is abundant. Now, 
what we've seen to this point then is the promise of God, the promises of God provide a potential for our partnership in the divine nature. We have seen that we have escaped the authority of this world system, not the influence, but the authority of that influence. We have a choice in the matter. As unbelievers, we didn't have that choice. And then in the sphere of our dependency upon those promises, we're to fully supply that proper behavior that will gain for us the highest opinion of those that observe us. And in that sphere of behavior, we are to fully supply the process of taking in knowledge, seeking knowledge through study. And we're to do those things with diligence, uh, making it a principle to repeatedly exhibit an earnest zeal and haste uh, in, and a complete dedication in walking that way. Now, we move then from that fifth verse to verse six and seven. Let's see how far along we can get with this tonight. Are you staying with me? Didn't uh, lose me in those definitions and take a mind trip and let me carcass sit tonight. Take care of your carcass while you're off somewhere in your mind. <laughs> Hang in there and uh, we'll, we'll try to make it understandable. Look at verse six. And within that sphere of knowledge, uh, temperance. Add temperance. And to temperance, patience. And to patience, godliness. And then we'll see in verse 7, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So remember, we are developing these within more constricting circles. Faith, within that faith, a proper response will bring us moral of the correct moral behavior. And if we have the correct moral behavior, we'll be able to seek knowledge. And now within that knowledge, we're going to seek to fully establish temperance. Well, I don't know about you, but I grew up in an age when every word mentioned the word temperance, that meant abstinence from alcohol. Now, that's not what this word means. The word temperance that is used here in this verse identifies self-controlled will. The self-controlled will. Isn't that what we've been looking for? We keep being victimized by the old sin nature. We talked about being seduced by the old man, that, that he and his minions bait uh, traps that appear to our lust pattern, and we find ourselves victimized by it so that though we, we are a spouse to the Lord Jesus Christ as the bride of Christ, we find ourselves committing spiritual adultery with the old man and, and having sin in our life again. We just seem not to be able to control it. Would you look where self-control is in this process that Peter lays out? We have, first of all, to develop a an environment or a sphere of faith in which we believe and place our dependency upon the word of God. And then within that sphere of faith, we are to develop then by applying the word of God to our life, the proper moral behavior. And then within that proper moral behavior, we are to develop the process of seeking or taking in knowledge gaining knowledge from the Word of God. And as we gain that knowledge of the Word of God within that sphere, we are to develop fully self-control. So we want to start with self-control. If I had self-control, then I wouldn't have to worry about these things. Self-control is part of a process. You're not going to have victory over that old nature and self-control in your daily walk unless you have taken in the word of God. And we're going to talk about that 
a, a little later, uh, not tonight, but in, in the weeks that come, about how we process God's Word, how we take in knowledge. But you are not going to be able to take in knowledge unless you have the right relationship with God in your moral behavior. And, and that seems, well, how do I get the proper moral behavior if my self-control is yet to be developed within that moral behavior? That's 1 John 1, 9. That's accepting uh, Christ as our personal Savior and making us holy and without blame before Him. And then confessing our sin, we develop that proper moral behavior so we can take in knowledge, so that through taking in knowledge, we can develop self-control. But it all goes back to the first sphere of faith, what we believe, and our placing our dependency upon these things. So within that specific sphere of knowledge, we are to develop self-control. This word in the Greek uh, is uh, another feminine uh, noun. It is feminine because it's a response. See, if we simply follow the process, these things will happen of themselves. Not something we have to initiate, not something we have to develop. It's a response to the preceding activity that we were in as a response to the preceding activity, as a response to the preceding activity. This self-centered uh, or, or self-control is exercised by the believer relates then to the individual's free will. With our free will, we as individuals can choose to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. The control of the Holy Spirit is our choosing. And uh, uh, that ability to develop that is a result of our being born again. Before we are born again, we do not have a human spirit. We cannot understand the things of God. They are spiritual. We have to develop a, a capacity for that. And so as we place our faith upon the person of Christ and upon the word of God, we develop a proper moral behavior, relationship of virtue with God, so that we are able then in, in that situation to take in knowledge. And as we take in knowledge and we, we place our faith upon that knowledge, we, we are dependent upon that knowledge, we respond to that knowledge, self-control begins to manifest itself. Now, it's within that sphere of self-control that we are to develop patience. Patience. Uh, this word, hupo monane, the two words, hupo is under and monane is abide, comfortably. It's abiding comfortably within your circumstances, the ability to abide under any circumstance and be comfortable. See where that is? We have gone from, from faith to virtue, from virtue to knowledge, from knowledge to self-control, and now we get to the ability to be comfortable under whatever circumstances we are encountering. Now, Peter put this process together under the direction of the Holy Spirit. This is the Word of God. This isn't the theology of Troy Welch. It is God's revelation to us of the process that we go through in order that we might have Christ's likeness, uh, that divine nature, the characteristics of it might be reflective in our life that others might attest that we have been with him, that we might have self-control in our life, and ultimately that we might be down to love, that self-sacrificial love that motivates us to love others with a self-sacrificial love that manifests itself in giving and continues to love regardless of the response. So we're on our way to that, but we, we are here now with the word patience. Patience 
is a feminine noun. Are you remembering what we said about the feminine gender? It identifies the responder. See, in the human race, God designed the woman to be the responder, the man to be the initiator. Now, we've, we've, we've mixed that up so much anymore that some are even confused about whether they're men, men or women. Uh, and it might depend upon the particular day, whether they're feeling their feminine side or the masculine side. We, we've completely distorted uh, the word of God. But this, this idea of a feminine noun means that it's a response. See, we don't have to do the work. We simply have to respond to the word. As we respond to that process that God has established, God works his change in our life. You want patience? You want the ability to abide under any circumstance? Well, it is an automatic response to those who have uh, uh, moved through this process. They develop self-control. And then they develop that self-control within, which is a response to their taking in the knowledge of the Word of God. And they develop that knowledge of the Word of God by taking in virtue, by, by establishing a proper relationship with God so they are holy and without blame before Him. And they've done that within the sphere of faith. All of it is a response. Your response to faith provides the ability then so that you a response to that faith can be virtue. And a response to that virtue is knowledge. And a response to that knowledge is self-control. And a response to that self-control is to abide comfortably under what circumstance you might be involved in. Each one of these is singular. There is one faith. There is one virtue. There is one knowledge. There is one self-control, and there is one ability to abide under circumstances comfortable. But we're not through, because there are two other spheres that are developed as they get more constricting in our lives as believers. Within that sphere of patience, that is, within the sphere of your ability to abide under any circumstance, you are to develop a godliness. I guess we got three to go, don't we? A godliness. Godliness. What in the world is godliness? You mean as I, as I develop my faith, and then within that faith, I... Uh, develop virtue, and within that virtue, I develop knowledge, and within that knowledge, uh, I develop self-control, and within that self-control, uh, I develop uh, the ability to abide comfortably under whatever circumstance I'm in. Now, within that sphere, I develop godliness. Godliness is translated from the Greek word, which means that consistency of duty to God, which is characterized by a Godward attitude, which does that which is pleasing to him. Have you got there yet? Well, certainly there are times in our life. But how about a consistency? Consistency of duty to God, which is characterized by a Godward attitude which does that, which is pleasing to God. That's one of our objectives. It's a feminine noun. It's a response to our ability to, no matter what our circumstances are, to be comfortably at home, which is a response to our self-control, which is a response to the knowledge we've been taking in, which is a response to virtue, which is a response to faith. So we continually move through from one process to another. 
Now, in each of these, we are to develop them fully. Now, you don't have to develop them fully before you move on to the other one, because when you get part of one, you got part of two. When you get part of two, you got part of three, and it continues to work its way through here. Now, in addition to godliness, within the sphere of godliness, you are to develop brotherly kindness. That's the word that we get brotherly love from. Philadelphia, uh, the city of Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love, not because they're lovely there, but because the Greek word means brotherly love. We are admonished to love our brothers. You see where it is in the development of maturity in our lives? It's not out here on the surface. We try to go out and love our brothers and have that brotherly love of one another, but it doesn't have any support. It's in the sphere of faith, a dependency upon God and his word that we develop virtue, that is our holiness and righteousness with God. It's within that sphere of virtue then that we develop knowledge. And within that sphere of knowledge, that we develop self-control. And within that sphere of self-control, that we develop that ability to be comfortably at home. And within that sphere of being comfortable under what are our circumstances, we develop that consistency uh, of attitude toward that is Godward, so that we we tend to do that which pleases him. And it's within that, that sphere that we are able to have brotherly love. We are to develop a brotherly love for others in that sphere. But there's one more sphere. Within that sphere of kind affection, of brotherly affection for others, we are to develop agape love. That is self-sacrificial love that manifests itself in giving and continues to love regardless of the response. See, phylos adelphos, brotherly love, phileo is the kind of love that is dependent upon a response. But we move beyond that to a self-sacrificial love where it doesn't make any difference what the response is. We have a self-sacrificial attitude that manifests itself in giving. This is the definition of agape love. A self-sacrificial love that manifests itself in giving and continues to love regardless of the response. Well, we pick up the gospel of the epistle of John, and it says that we are to love one another. That we're to have a self-sacrificial love for one another. We sermons, we preachers in our sermons beat the pulpit and say, we need to love one another with a self-sacrificial love. You see the process of it? We need to stop and explain. Now, if you're going to develop that kind of love, it's surrounded by some other spheres that have to be developed. Now, let me point out again that you don't fully develop one sphere and have that down to perfection before you develop the other. No, as you develop one you begin to develop the other. And as you begin to develop it, you begin to develop the next and the next and the next until we get to the core. So some of us have a self-sacrificial love for others because in the process, we have developed this some faith in the word of God and some virtue and within that virtue knowledge and to some knowledge then self-control and and so it spills over into the next 
what we're looking for is to fully develop it. See, he said fully develop in each sphere is to fully be developed. Well, let's see how much time we got. I, I, I don't know. I'm going to be 81 in a few months. I don't, the span of a man's life is three score 10. That's 70. So I won't borrow time already, but he does tell us we can lengthen or shorten our days. Though they've been established, we can lengthen or shorten them. And apparently he's allowed me to lengthen mine. I remember one admonition is that uh, this in, in the 10 commandments, honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the face of the earth. That was the first command given with promise. And it's not long, it's longer. That your days may be longer upon the face of the earth. So I took in my mother-in-law and uh, she lived with us for 13 years. And then I took in my mom and dad. My dad, uh, mom and dad lived with us a couple of years. And then my dad passed away and my mother lived with us five years. Um, I, I call that honoring. I think that's part of the process of honoring. So I don't know how many years he might have added. Anyway, all of that, uh, it would be interesting to take the time and look at each one of these. We could spend weeks and months upon each one of these. The sphere of faith, the sphere of virtue, the sphere of knowledge, the sphere of self-control. See, we could, we could spend considerable time on each one of them. Uh, in this particular study that I'm doing with you, we, we're just kind of moving through it very quickly, but you can see what you can do on your own in exploring these things. How is your love life? <laughs> I, I mean your relationship with God and other believers in your self-sacrificial attitude and manifestation of that in giving to them. Maybe some of these spheres need to be developed a little more fully for that to develop fully. So I point out again, if, if I were to, to ask you what the feminine gender means, could you tell me that means that we're talking about a response or a responder? Because that is important in this particular study uh, as it relates to the development of the characteristics of godly, uh, of Christ likeness and godliness in our lives is related to our responding to the instruction to do, develop fully faith within faith, virtue, within virtue, knowledge, within knowledge, self control, and, and moving on down till we get to the core of the issue, which is self sacrificial love. Now, kind of like the way Peter lays it out. And, and when you break it down that way, you can kind of see the process that's involved. Having said that, we're going to, what's well, my term, shift gears <laughs> again. Uh, we're going to take a little different direction on this subject of spiritual maturity because we've seen that we have to have faith in the promises and the principles that God has established. Uh, there is a structure that we can develop out of the building materials that form the verses and chapters and books of the Bible. The Bible is the framework for which we can develop a structure from which we as Christians can operate and function with. And so uh, I, I sent that down your way. We'll, I see the clock on the wall is moving right along and we're not going to get there uh, this evening. Uh, if you see, if you drag this stuff out, it's called, job security don't tell pastor carlos but job security to to drag it out uh but it, it i i hope we're going at a rate <laughs> i hope you're we're going at a rate that we'll be able to 
Well, they covered the clock and then they took it down. You guys were going to stay all night. There. Well, there's no end to it. You can't exhaust the word of God. So uh, uh, we, we will uh, next week, Lord willing, uh, we'll pick up at this point because we are, are going to look at how to go about establishing this. What are, it's fine to say, develop within the sphere of faith, develop that sphere of faith, and then within it, develop virtue. And But how do we do that? How do we do that? And uh, I've been in a series at the church this month. Uh, it, it's the how do you do series. That's not a greeting. I'm not asking how are you getting along. How do we do what God's word says? How do we become doers of the word and not hearers only? Well, see, we preachers sometimes spend so much time pounding the pulpit and exhorting what you ought to be doing and chastising you because you ain't doing what's right. And we neglect to tell you how. Well, the Bible didn't neglect it. Thank goodness. Thank the Lord for that. And so we need to explore that. And so we're going to look at the process of spiritual maturity and the mechanical side of it that Paul lays out. Paul equates it, this framework in which we are to operate, as a five-floored building with a foundation and a roof. Now, I've been a builder, and so that relates to me. I'm, I'm able to relate to that and to understand that and drawing blueprints and building uh, uh, houses and a couple of church buildings in the process through the years. Uh, but Paul lays it out for us. We're going to use that guideline uh, to uh, relate to how to do this. We can read the scripture. Where do we put that? See, so many of the sermons and uh, so much of our, our teaching, we listen to it. We try to get as much as we can. We understand we're not going to get it all, but then get the encouragement from the preacher that he's repetition. He's going to come back and repeat it again, as we talked a little bit uh, last week about in the question and answer time. Uh, but if we're not careful, we take those sermons or we take our personal Bible study and we just pitch it over on the desk and we don't put it in any kind of order. And so frequently uh, it looks like my desk and the surrounding area around me with all the stacks of paper and things that are there. And then I get ready to look for something. I start having to go through one stack and then another stack and another stack. Matter of fact, I've been doing some of that uh, as I've been talking, saying, now, which is the one I just finished and where am I going? The Bible performs a guideline for us or provides a guideline for us. If, if that information that you take is put into a file folder and put into a file cabinet and organized in a in an order then when you need it you can go back and get it a lot easier than going through the stacks of paper so we're going to talk about that uh, we're going to look at it and and see how all scripture relates to these various areas of spiritual growth that we need we need to develop and we need a base of operation, a place to operate out of. We introduced Fort Grace in our earlier study a while back. So we're going to look at the structure of spiritual maturity. We're going to see it designed as a five-story building with a roof and a foundation. The foundation is Jesus Christ and all of his teaching. I'm not talking about the red letter edition because the in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. So Jesus' teaching in his humanity began with his earthly time. 
but the teachings of Christ began in Genesis. So Genesis 1 through Revelation 22 is what we're talking about as the foundation. Now we have to understand it properly and what, what was written to whom and what applies to us and, and, and the understanding of all that. But a personal relationship with Christ is the foundation and then his teaching. Now, upon that, we're going to develop a structure that is a framework. It's not going, it's going to be a building that is a frame construction. So uh, the planks and the beams and the boards that are in the building are going to be books of the Bible, verses in the Bible, chapters in the Bible that relate to these particular areas. So there's going to be a first floor, a second floor, a third floor, a fourth floor, a fifth floor, and roof. I tell you right now, the roof is the 7,000 plus promises of God that he has given us in time. Now, it's not like the spheres. You don't develop one completely and then develop the other. As you develop part of this process, it relates to the others. So in a frame construction, when you start building the framework for the first floor, you build the framework for the first, second, third, fourth, fifth floor, and the roof. As a matter of fact, under a framing inspection, when I would call the inspector out to check my framing, the all the framework had to be up and the roof had to be on. That was part of the framework. And so we had a floor here and a floor here and a floor here and a floor here, etc. But they were dependent for support on the floor below them. And then we go through and we start doing the other work. We run the electricity and the plumbing and, and get the mechanical and do, get all of that stuff going. And then we start drywalling. And, but we, we do that as, as one gets a little, one floor gets a little, the next floor gets a little. You get a little uh, in, in the area of faith, then you get a little in the area of virtue. And and a proportion to that, you, you get knowledge, and to knowledge, self-control, and to self-control godly, and, and you move through that process. So we're going to lay it out um, in, in the framework, and we're going to see that each floor uh, is comprised and supported of Bible information. We need that base of operation, so as we grow in Christ, up into Christ, we have a base from which we can operate and there can be consistency in our walk. So that's where we're headed next week. Um, clock's been put back on the wall to say, hey, you're over time. It's time to start the question and answer period. So I'm here. Who'll be first? I need to drink in. Not drink in. Tea. Hello, doctor. Good evening. Good evening. All right. I have you don't, have to, you don't have to doctor me. I'm not sick. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, you can still tell me about that mustache. You didn't tell me about that shit. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> That's not my question, but here's my question. It's a question into another question. All right. When Satan uh, deceived Eve in the garden, was he kicked out? of heaven with no access back to heaven? No. Okay. That's quite, a, and, and it's just easy to answer yes or no. That, of course, not the answer we need. When we, when we trace what transpired, we find in Scripture that before Adam and Eve were on this earth, before, I'll probably stir up a... a can of worms now. Before Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, Satan rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven. He took up residence on the earth. He and his cohorts took a third of the angels with him in his rebellion. And they turned the earth into an environmental chaotic disaster. And God booted them off 
and sunk the earth into a block of ice. He made, uh, he covered the earth with ice. And then at the appointed time, God thawed that ice out and in six days of creation, he created light, he created man, he created everything that's recorded in those six days of creation. Now that's, that's viewing creation from a gap perspective, believing that there is a gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. Now the reason we believe that is because in Genesis 1-2 in the Hebrew, it does not say the earth was without form and void. It says the earth became, became without form and void. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, period. Done deal. And then the earth became tohu wabohu, an environmental chaotic disaster, and God packed it into an ice pack. When it says the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, it's brooded, the word is incubated or brooded upon the melting ice. Now, we know that through the Hebrew text. So that's a, that's a study of its own, and there are a lot of people that disagree with that. Uh, those of us who approach it from a language approach believe that to be true. So we believe that Satan was here, and you go to Isaiah and Ezekiel, and they, in there you have the dialogue uh, with Satan about what he did and how he turned the Eden of God into a chaotic disorder and, and all of that. Tohu wabohu is the same thing. Now, my position on that is that then God thought it out and created it for man and placed man on it. Uh, that evil was already present uh, seems to be clear when God gave instruction to Adam, go, go forth and subdue the earth. Subdue it. Well, that meant it was out. There, there, there was some problem. He said, have, take dominion over it. So he identifies some processes there. So my position is that, that when God created it for Adam and Eve, for man, and then Satan came back as the tempter, and he tempted Adam and Eve. He tempted Eve, deceived her, and, and, and Adam was caught up in the process as well. I believe that in the middle of the tribulation, Satan is going to be prohibited from access to heaven. I believe Satan has access to heaven today. He's called, the word Satan means accuser, and the scripture indicates he, he accuses us before God. Mm -hmm. But three and a half years into the tribulational period, he will no longer, he will be thrown out so that he has no access to heaven. Yeah, that's that's when really the intensity really, uh, the tribulation is really intensified at that point. Okay. He sees the clock running out. So that's my position. Well, the reason I was asking that question because in Job chapter 1, verse 6, when God asks uh, Satan, where have you come from? He says, from Romans 2 and 4, on the earth. So I know that God wasn't having a meeting with his angels on earth. So Satan had to have some access to leave the earth to go to wherever the destination where the Lord was at. And I would assume that was heaven. Yes, I, I think that's a safe assumption under what we find in Scripture. Okay, so I just uh, need some clarity on that because I've been doing some study on this uh, access thing back and forth because I remember Jesus, when Jesus, in I think the book of Luke, he said that he saw Satan cast out of heaven like a bolt of lightning. Yeah, and, and when, you, when you follow that through in Revelation, mm -hmm. you find that that's going to occur in the middle of the tribulation where he no longer has that access. Right, so that hasn't taken place yet. Not yet. Okay. He lost his position, mm -hmm. but he still has access. He will lose his access at the middle of the tribulation and then at the end of the millennial reign, he will be thrown in the lake of fire and brimstone. Absolutely. Thank you, Doctor. All right. Well, we gotta talk about and, that mustache though. 
Oh, <laughs> what's that about the mustache? I need to know about that curly part right there. What's you know the what causes that? Yeah, what causes yeah. that? When my wife kisses me. Yeah, you got the same. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. You're 80. <laughs> That's my story, and I'm staying by it. <laughs> now we'll we'll have to get into those other studies. That come on up. That's you know I I've just given you my my position on it. You really need a lot of scripture that backs that up. Uh, Pastor Carlos probably has um, uh, some of that available. He should have in some of the studies and syllabuses that we've done. So you might talk with him about pursuing it further. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, that's about Satan, not about mustache. Okay. Well, no, no, you're sticking to okay. the story about that mustache. <laughs> okay. Enough foolishness. We got another question. Good evening. Um, good evening, Pastor Welch. Um, all right, so I'm going to, I still have some questions about uh, what I asked you last Tuesday. Um, so what I really wanted to get to, because I kind of was jumping around there, not really asking that question, but um, do you think there's such thing as evil music if the words are godly? I think that there is a beat that that is found in heathen societies that contributes, that, that has some connotation with evil. Uh, in 1937, um, in the Lenin School of, of Warfare in Russia, Stalin, Joseph Stalin said, if you want to destroy a nation, and he, there are 10 steps in that process. And one of those was to pick a musical beat from a decadent society, like in some of the areas in Africa, where there's a lot of demon activity and, and voodooism and whatnot and exaggerate that beat and in, in, introduce it into a culture and you destroy the culture. Well, all 10 of the points that he established as a way to overthrow the United States, he, the, we're pretty well accomplished them today. But I don't know that, that there is a particular evil myth about music, I, about some music. I, I'm sure that because music is such a powerful tool that, that Satan's minions can use it just as, as God would use it in many ways. So who's to determine that? I, I don't know what the guidelines are for really determining that. Uh, if it if it generates in an individual sensual or sexual movement, then I think it ought to be avoided. And I've been in some church services where the music did just that. If you, matter of fact, uh, if you shut the sound off and you, you didn't hear it, you just watched the gyration of the people, you would think you were in a bar somewhere instead of in a church somewhere. So I think the effect that music has on people is something that must be considered. And I'm not the standard for determining that uh, at all. Uh, but that's my opinion on it. Uh, there's nothing in scripture that I know of specifically, and th there may be that I haven't been directed to, that would identify such. Um, but music contributes tremendously to a culture of people. Rather than being 
an expression of the culture, I find in my experience that it really helps develop the culture. Uh, and so I think there's a concern there that, that we have to take into consideration. You might explore that and see what you discover about it. Um, okay. How about uh, in the, uh, where does it say in the Bible that you have to worship a certain way? <laughs> well, the, the worship of people is really based pretty much on the culture. We're not given a lot of instruction in Scripture about our worship. Uh, worship, we, we try to relate worship to the auditorium uh, uh, when the congregation is there and the music program and, and that true worship is, God said that he's not worshipped in in buildings made by hands, but in, in our heart. True worship is manifest in service. Now, the, the music program and the public worship program in our churches is pretty much designed originally in the church as a, a means of encouragement or exhortation. Uh, people say, hey, I, I believe my gifts are in music. I don't find music as a spiritual gift. Look under the word exhortation. Exhortation means encouragement and, and motivation, and music does that. Uh, and so I, I really believe our worship is not in the service. Our true worship is what we generate in our daily walk our individual walk with God. But through the years, the, the synagogue under the Jewish uh, in, uh, administration, uh, they sang psalms um, and, and music was a part of, of their time to meet together. It was generally scripture that was, was presented in, in music or scriptural truth. And um, and I think that ought to be the objective of it. All too many times, the music, um, in my experience, uh, is substituted um, for for proper motivation. The music gets the people excited and generated and motivated. And many of music leaders have told me uh, to get them ready for the word, to get them ready for. And so I usually reverse the service. I believe we have our church service all backwards. I believe the church, the message should come first. That the word should motivate us to worship. There you go. Yeah. And then following the, the, the message, then we ought to have our worship time. A time of, of praising directly to God. A time of encouraging one another through psalms and hymns. A time of, of, of strengthening our scripture through song. See, in the book of Ephesians, it identifies three types of singing that is to occur in the church. So it, it indicates there's supposed to be singing in the church. There's to be psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. In Ephesians chapter 5, that's set up. What is a psalm? Psalm is scripture that has been set to music. Direct scripture set to music. A hymn is a scriptural truth. It's a doctrinal truth that is set to music. And spiritual songs are songs that are directed to God from us. So there is to be a mixture of those three types. Now, the type of music... Uh, we're talking about the words in, in that type of singing. The type of music is, is not specified. Cool. But um, I've attempted in a number of places where I've pastored, I've attempted to turn the service around uh, while you're beating your head against a rock because people are conditioned that when the sermon is done, they're done and it's time to go home. The invitation and, and closing and we're out of here. You have an invitation, and then you say, all right, now sit down, and we're going to have our worship time. We're going to praise the Lord, or we're going to encourage one another in singing. Um, it, it, it just has not been effective. The only place 
where I ever found it effective was a church that I started from scratch back in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It was a congregation that had been studying our Bible study tapes uh, from our school in Monrovia. We had a Bible college in seminary in Monrovia back in the 70s and early 80s. And they, there was a group of 45 adults that every Friday night sat down for two hours and listened to one of the tapes. And they wanted to start a, a, a church. And I went back and helped them start a church, intending to send a pastor, but God had other designs. And I went back and spent three years there with them. Because we started it from scratch, and because they had been exposed to my teaching on it, they were receptive to it, and it worked well. But to go into a, a traditional congregation and try to turn it around, it just doesn't fly. Uh, it really kills the worship time because people are ready to go home after the sermon's done. We just program that way. Okay. But... Uh, but I really believe that the word should get us ready for worship, not the worship get us ready for the word. Right. I think the tail wags the dog there. But um, uh, we need to encourage one another, and we do that through hymns, reminding one another of doctrinal truths, through psalms, reminding one another and encouraging one another through scripture. But we need some direct praise to God too, and that's through spiritual psalms. Now, so much of the spiritual songs that I'm introduced to are not doctrinally sound. They're what I call 7-Eleven music. It's um, seven words, 11 repetitions. <laughs> and so we have to be careful. The Bible says beware of vain repetitions. Now, not all repetitions are vain. Vain means empty. And so there are some. Uh, there's place for repetitiousness in, in the songs, but it needs to be solid uh, praise and doctrine that, that is found. So that's that's kind of my position. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Doctor. All right. Have a good night. How's it going, Doctor? Yes, sir. Uh, this kind of pertains to Jermaine, uh, <laughs> Jerome's question uh, regarding what you said, Genesis. Um, it was written in Hebrew and Aramaic, correct? Well, it was originally written in Hebrew. There was no Aramaic during that in the Old Testament, not in Genesis. Okay. Well, well, my now, Genesis was translated then to Greek. My, uh, my concern comes from trusting anyone's translation from from Greek or Hebrew to twist the meaning of something and uh, me not knowing Greek or Hebrew I'm, I'm you know, being left to trust in that translation with no recourse but to either learn Hebrew or Greek to completely understand uh, you know what you're saying or what Absolutely. that person's saying uh, especially in an expanded translation where something so small can be expanded so big yeah. So how do we go about entrusting an expanded translation and not losing the literal translation to a, a spiritual translation? I think with an expanded translation, what we're saying, we're not, if the expanded translation is truly an expanded, not an amplified, there's a difference. An amplified translation is to insert interpretation into it. Maybe the accurate interpretation, but it's to insert interpretation into it. An expanded translation is to take the nuances of the various aspects of Greek grammar and, and translate it fully based on the aspects of the Greek grammar. For instance, a verb has um, a tense, mood, voice, and uh, the tense tells the kind of action that's going on there. So in every verb, we can look at the grammar and tell what kind of action is going on. Is it continuous? Or is it in a point of time? Or did it occur in the past and the result continues forever? All of that is in Greek grammar. So 
when I do an expanded translation, what I'm attempting to do is bring out what the tense of this word says. Why was it in the present tense or why was it in the perfect tense? When it could have been either, the writer chose to use this one because the perfect tense identifies a completed action in patch with a result continuing forever, where the present tense identifies continuous action, where the aorist tense identifies a point of time. So then you have the mood. Is it indicative, which means it really happened? Is it subjunctive, which means it's potential? Is it imperative, where there is a command? So Greek grammar is so, so expressive and so exact. Now, we don't have that detail in the Hebrew. We do have some aspect of that, but not to the Greek. So we can't get that exactness in the Old Testament like we can in the New Testament. Uh, so when I do an expanded translation or when I read what someone has called an expanded translation, not to interject our interpretation or harmonizing either of the scriptures into it, but what is found in that verb or that noun or that infinitive. And because I believe that the grammar is part of the divine inspiration, that every jot and tittle God put there purposefully, then that's the route I go. I may get to heaven and hear, why did you waste so much time <laughs> talking about the grammar? That's not what I was emphasizing. But in my study, I don't expect that to occur because I do believe that the grammar is part of the divine inspiration. Now, when we get into the Old Testament to a passage like the one I've cited, where in, it says, and the earth became rather than was, it's not just the Hebrew word that, that is found there. And here is a problem that we get into with both the Hebrew and the Greek. I read an article some years ago that said almost no modern Hebrew scholar would translate this wa as became instead of was. Almost no modern Hebrew scholar. Well, we the Bible was not written in modern Hebrew. The Bible was written in ancient Hebrew, which became a, a lost language, except among the, ra the rabbis. And it was more of a written language than it was a verbal language for many, many years. So in order to understand it and translate it right, you've got to go back to that time and find out what the word meant at the time. Not what it might mean today, but what it meant then. And what was the common interpretation or translation of it by writers in that day? You'll find many of the Hebrew scholars identify that very clearly that there was a gap of time between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2. Another aspect of, of testing the validity of that translation is, does it harmonize with other scriptures? And when you get into Ezekiel and Isaiah, though these things had to transpire before Adam and Eve were here in the, the language that is given. And the term tohu wabohu always only is used in, in something going into a, a chaotic environment, uh, not that being the original. Environment. So there's there's a lot of like I said it's it's really not fair to lay out a, a statement like that and not have proper time to go to those scriptures and pull them together and go to the language and pull that together. So we need to be careful about people's modern day translation. What's the basis of their translation? What do they cite as the reason for doing this? What, what's the, the um, proof, the evidence that they project for interpreting a passage in a certain way? Uh, if a scripture verse does not harmonize, our interpretation of it does not harmonize with every single passage of scripture in the word of God, it's the wrong one. 
because God's word doesn't contradict itself. So uh, we, we have a lot of folks that are in the uh, Reformed theology movement, and you say, well, what do you do about Christ died for, not for us only, but for all, that he died for the sins of the whole world? Well, that's what it says, but that can't be what it means because it doesn't agree with our theology. Well, there's something wrong with the theology, see. And, and the state, well, we can't understand all that. It's beyond us. When we get to heaven, we'll understand it all. Well, then don't teach it till we get to heaven. We, we need not to teach something that conflicts with something else in Scripture. And uh, so there are some passages that I say, well, now, I can't be exact on this. This is my opinion, and here's why it's my opinion, but I could, can't be exact on it. And then another question I had is uh, a lot of times I hear uh, that uh, to explain one Greek word in English, uh, it takes, you know, a sentence or a paragraph to explain it in English. Sometimes. Uh -huh. uh, isn't that um, true for, you know, defining any word? You can't really define it without laying it out in a sentence. So can't you say that for any language? Well, what, what we mean by that is take the word agape. How is that word normally translated? Love. That's not what, there, there are three other words, there are four Greek words that are translated love. How do we know which one's being used here and what's being said of it? When Jesus was talking with Peter on the seashore after his resurrection and they'd gone fishing all night and hadn't caught anything and Jesus appeared on the side of the, uh, on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and he said to Peter, do you love me? You remember that discourse in John? Peter, do you love me more than these things? Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. He said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. He said, feed my lambs. He said to him the third time, Peter, do you love me? And it grieved Peter that he said to him the third time, do you love me? And Peter said, you know all things, you know I love you. And he said, feed my sheep. Now, when we look at that in the Greek, Jesus said to Peter, Peter, do you agapao me? Peter said, Lord, you know all things, you know I phileo you. He didn't use the word. He used another word for love. The translators translated both of them love. There's a difference. He said to him the second time, Peter, do you agapao me? Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know I phileo you. He said to him the third time, Peter, do you phileo me? And it grieved Peter that he said, do you phileo me? And he said, you know all things. You know I phileo you. So if we don't see the different Greek word, we don't understand what was going on there. The word agapao, that's the verb of the Greek noun uh, agape. Agape is the noun, agapao is the verb. Peter was being asked by our Lord, do you love me? And agapao can only accurately be defined as a self-sacrificial love that manifests itself in giving and continues to love regardless of the response. That's how that word ought to be translated every time we translate it into English. You see how long it gets? <laughs> Phileo love is a brotherly type of love. It's a love that is dependent upon the response. He said to Peter, Peter, do you love me with a self-sacrificial love that manifests itself in giving? And continues to love regardless of the response. And Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know I have a responsive love. So he said to him, the second, you have a self-sacrificial love. So when we, when we get into the Greek words, they are so comprehensive. And, and it's true of the whole language. That if we don't enlarge on them, we don't get the accurate meaning from it. But sometimes, and I wrestle with this throughout my life, I've wrestled with this, sometimes 
especially if you're doing it verbally and the person doesn't have it in front of them, they can read. It, you get lost in it because it gets so extensive. You get lost in it. And, and I, I deal, try to deal with that. And that's why I print out everything that I preach. I print out the, uh, the, the Greek word, the, the form of the word, of where that word is found uh, in, in scripture, what it actually means and how it really translates. Can't, do we have to have that to have a right relationship with God? No. Do we need that to understand exactly what God's word says? Yes. So somewhere in, in between those two, we find the balance. And uh, that's, that's my response to it. Awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Been an interesting how a little short question <laughs> takes such a long answer sometimes. All right. Well, I've enjoyed the evening with you, gentlemen, and uh, hope I haven't lost all of you. What you got? Sitting down for two hours. <laughs> yes, sir. All right. Um, I'm working on my uh, spiritual maturity, um, but I'm starting with John, and um, struggling in a few areas. It says um, in Matthew uh, three eleven, um, also Mark one and eight, and Luke three and sixteen. Uh, it says he will baptize you. He will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. What does that mean? Oh, another can of worms tonight, huh? Um, I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't know how to do that. No, that's 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 fine. The church has been divided over these things for quite a number of years now, and and the answer that I gave relative to the language is really key in understanding this because some see the baptism of the Holy Spirit as being the word baptized needs to be immersed into union with uh, for the purpose of identification. And so they, they see that we, there, there is a second blessing or a, an immersion into the Holy Spirit. But the Greek prepositions that are used in those contexts uh, indicate that the Holy Spirit is the agent that does the baptism. The Holy Spirit baptizes us into Christ. Okay. And then the, the passage that says that, and John the Baptist was talking and he said, I baptize with water, but there's one that comes after me whose shoes I'm not worthy of unless he'll baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And with fire, uh-huh. There, you don't want the fire baptism. You want the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the, the fire is always, always, without exception, in Scripture, a symbol of judgment. From Genesis through Revelation, it is a symbol of judgment. It's being baptized either with the Holy Spirit or with fire. Or with fire. Holy Spirit and fire in the Greek. It's the Holy Spirit. He will baptize some with Holy Spirit. He will baptize some with fire. And and so there's there's a distinction in that passage from the others, where he's talking about the immersion with the Holy Spirit. Now the idea that this was a second blessing after salvation. Uh, yeah. was based really upon those that that were not knowledgeable in the language uh, of the scriptures and and presume some things um, that want to equate it to an emotional experience uh, and that stems from some of the experiences happened in the early church uh, with uh, those that were Samaritans, when they received Christ 
a savior, they they received the Holy Spirit and there was speaking in tongues on that occasion, just as there was at Pentecost. And then the disciples of John as well, John the Baptist, they didn't know Christ had come. And so they, they said uh, uh, to them, have you received the Holy Spirit since you uh, were, were baptized, were, were saved? With what baptism were you baptized? Well, we're baptized with John. Uh, John's baptism was with a view to repentance, but the baptism of the church age is with a view to having our sins been permitted. And so we had that, we that occasion. Well, we were in a period of transition, and of course, I, I don't really want to open up the other can of worms that goes with that in speaking of tongues and the gift of tongues, uh, but I'm backed up against the wall a little bit, so I'll, I'll touch it just a little bit. Uh, many that I know that are involved in the concept that we can receive a baptism of the Spirit on us uh, equate that with speaking in tongues uh, as an evidence of that. And uh, there's, there's a um, passage uh, in Mark chapter 16 that they generally point to but when we, when we do our study on the authenticity of Scripture, we find that those verses were not in any of the old manuscripts. They did not appear in any manuscripts until the 10th to the 14th century. That refer, that you, that identify they will speak with new tongues, They'll be able to drink poison and not be not be harmed. They'll be able to handle vipers and not be harmed. That passage, there's no, no history of those statements in any uh, account of the Gospel of Mark until after the 10th century. They appear to be added at a later time there was a, the chapter, that 16th chapter, Mark Wren would end rather abruptly at verse 8, because from verse 9 down through the rest of the chapter, there's no, no ancient manuscript authority for that. Hmm. Now, whether somebody decided it needed a tail end put on it, what I don't, I don't have any idea as to how that developed, but I know that nowhere else in scripture are we told that we can hand, handle venomous snakes and not be handled or drink poison and not die. Uh, and then when we get into the study of, of the spiritual gift of tongues, Paul says, not all speak with tongues. So that passage in Mark says, they will speak in new tongues. So it's inclusive there. So. There are a number of reasons that we discard that as far as establishing any doctrine. Um, you have churches down in the southern part of the United States that handle rattlesnakes and cotton mouths and whatnot uh, to test their faith based on that passage. Okay. But, but that passage doesn't have authority. So it's not that you will receive a baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. It's one or the other. One if the you other. don't receive Christ and, and when we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us, to dwell in us. If we don't do that, then we're going to be have the baptism of fire, which is judgment. Right. The reason why I ask because it said the Holy Spirit and with fire. But um, okay, you pretty much summed it up for me. I have another question. Um, this one is in uh, Matthew 11, 11, 11, and Luke 7, 28. Um, did Jesus indicate that John the Baptist would not enter into heaven not enter into heaven yes and that's in uh, Matthew 11 11 and Luke 7 28 I'm not sure where this is that idea would be conveyed in that text let me take a look Matthew 11 11 yes that's Matthew 11 11 and Luke 7 28 
My lightning years not good, but you see the lightning. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding for that he is least in the kingdom of heaven, is greater than he. Why would that say he didn't go, wouldn't go to heaven? Because it says that, uh, it mentioned John the Baptist, and it says that he would not, or he's anything less than him, would not. You have what translation are you reading? I'm, I'm reading out a, a New King James Version. Okay, the, the King James simply says, Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not been, not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. There's nothing there that would indicate he wouldn't go. There's a comparison about the greatness of John the Baptist, but even the one that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John's ministry and, and work was in the Old Testament, covering con, concluding the Old Testament age, uh, but there's nothing that would stipulate he didn't go to heaven. Uh, he uh, he died before Christ was crucified. He was killed before Christ was crucified, and uh, uh, I I no no one that would uh, that in my presence ever attested that he didn't go to heaven. He knew who Christ was. He proclaimed who he was. That's what leads to my next question: Is uh, uh, John, who had announced the coming of the kingdom? did not have the opportunity to experience because he belonged to an earlier era. So, well, there's a distinction in the church age believer and the Jewish age believer. So all that that are make up the church are those that were, were saved after the resurrection of Christ. The church began on the day of Pentecost in 30 AD, 10 days after the ascension of Christ in heaven. Church age believers are the ones that are identified as the bride of Christ. Now, John the Baptist, I don't, will not be caught up at the rapture of the church because he was not in the church age. He was in the Jewish age. Right. And he won't receive his resurrection body until the second advent of Christ. When Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation and establishes his millennial kingdom, mm -hmm. then John and all the Old Testament saints will be raised. So he's part of that, and I understand that thinking, but to say that he wouldn't go to heaven. Okay. Um, the Now, now, there is a distinction in eternity. See, we, we talk about heaven and hell. Uh, we don't really uh, have a great deal of information about eternity. It's condensed down in a couple of chapters. Uh -huh. But we do know that the church age believers are going to be in the new Jerusalem with Christ as the bride of Christ throughout all eternity. And the new Jerusalem is going to be situated over the new earth. That all believers be from Adam to Christ, well, to, to the day of Pentecost in 30 AD. And from uh, that period of time, they are going to be not church age believers, but Jewish age believers. And before the Jewish age, the age of promise and and uh, uh, the age of, of law. Uh, so none of them are going to be in the new Jerusalem. They'll have access to it. The gates are going to be open uh, all the time, 12 gates. But the, the scriptures are, identify it as, as a satellite over the new earth. So all believers in every age, other than from Pentecost until the rapture, will be on the new earth. Those of us from Pentecost to rapture are church age believers. We're, 
the bride of Christ will be in the new Jerusalem in the city ruling and reigning with him from there. So there's that distinction. He, he won't be a part of that. Mm -hmm. Okay. He will be on the earth. Uh, new earth. But it's a heavenly state no matter where you are. <laughs> and the kingdom and, and the kingdom. It's just that we have a different role in eternity than they do. Yeah, so that curious, may so. be what the writer is, is conjecturing. Okay. Yeah, I was just kind of curious because I'm kind of like doing my study on him. So I just wanted to know where he was at with all this. Um, yeah. Um, he not only believed who Jesus Christ was, he introduced him and, uh, and identified him. He's certainly in the kingdom. Now, when, when you, we, we're, we in the church age have a special blessing beyond those others because of our unique relationship with Christ. Right. And so that's probably what the writer is, is uh, trying to convey. Um, but it's, what do you call heaven? <laughs> uh, are you going to create new heavens and a new earth? Right. Uh, yeah. So uh, it's going, go, he, he will, he's a part of the Jewish administration and will be on the new earth while we will be headquartered with Christ in the city. The city which is a satellite about 1,500 miles each way, 1,500 miles cubed. Some want to make a pyramid out of it. I don't know. The Bible says it's so tall and it's so wide and so deep, uh, 1,500 miles each way, roughly, uh, by the measurements that's given. So it could be a pyramid. Uh, uh, I, it's built four square, but the base of a pyramid is square. So um, I, I tend to think it's cubicle, but I can't prove that. Stick around one of these days, I'll tell you whether it is or not. Speaking of pyramids, one just walked in. There's Kyle. Where's Kyle been? There's Kyle right there. He dropped in to say hello. And is Kyle out of the program now? Hey, bastard. Where you been? I've been working. Been working? Yeah. That's a four-letter word. Work, four-letter word. <laughs> How you been? Bible, Bible says he who doesn't work doesn't eat, though. There you go. I've been eating too much and not working enough, so. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, don't tell the rest of the guys, but I, I got a new piece this week. Oh, you did? Yeah, we we're setting up a security team at the church, and I'm heading it up. And Mike, the only thing I had to carry was a 380 or a, uh, I have had a Smith 9, but it's awful heavy and wealthy. So one of the men just bought a um, Kimber uh, 1911 uh, 40 and 45 caliber. So, so what you it's the ultra carry two. What'd you get? He gave it to me. Oh, man. <laughs> he took my nine for that. We traded my two hundred and fifty dollar yeah. gun I bought twenty years ago, and his eight hundred dollar gun. That's nice. You bargained. That's mm -hmm. good. All right, Pastor. You have a good night. All right. All right. God bless you. Take you. care. Bye. Are we all done? Yeah. All right. I look forward to next week, and um, we'll um, you keep the questions coming. I'll keep trying to dig for answers. Let's close with prayer. Thank you, Father, for your love that sacrificed your only begotten Son on the cross of Calvary that we might have life and have it abundantly. Thank you for the word that guides us into the abundance that we can have and for the Holy Spirit that enables us. Give us wisdom, protection, and grace, and we give you thanks and glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good evening. What's left of it? Good night. Okay.